Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the kind of second part of knowledge production for modern heritage, this time focused more on the research question. My name is Lama, and together with Philip, I'm going to be again co moderating this panel. Um, I will first start by introducing our first speaker, Mercedes Voulet. Um, Mercedes Voulet holds a PhD from Marseille University and is research professor at the French National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. She has published extensively on architecture and heritage in modern Egypt. Her current research focuses on intercultural engagements with architecture, photography, and craft in 19th century Cairo. I'll hand it over to you. Is it? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Philippe and George for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I, yeah, I have enjoyed so far very much the conversation. So and I hope uh, this is an ongoing uh, conversation. Um, so this um, today we have, I mean, the, the topic of knowledge production has been uh, divided in two different sessions, uh, one targeting uh, documentation and this one uh, targeting uh, research. And I think uh, we have already seen so far how much uh, these two topics are intertwined. Um, so the first and possibly the most important thing I have to say is that documentation and research uh, worked at their best when they join efforts and when they uh, carry carry on uh, hand in hand their tasks. I also believe uh, that uh, research uh, is important. It does matter. It, it has a potential input. And uh, I would like to illustrate this uh, with a source, a, doc a document, <laughs> no, a, a source, actually. We already uh, have heard a lot um, already today, which is the magazine uh, El Amara. Uh, so for the sake of the record, this is a magazine who was published six times a year. Sometimes you had these tri tripal issues. Uh, as many other things, it was the, the, the only child of uh, one man, as Cairo Observer, or uh, the Arab Center for Architecture. Uh, so this was the child of um, Syed Koraim, and uh, because he was called Syed Koraim, uh, known as Syed Koraim at the time. And um, as Syed Koraim was the son of a minister, um, he had the you know, so significant social assets and cultural assets and the self-confidence um, to do things uh, until he clashed with the power and he was uh, stopped. But this is not only his story, the story of many other uh, people. Uh, this magazine is interesting um, because it shows um, architecture in the making in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, because we were speaking about pan-Arabism, pan uh, I have chosen to illustrate two architects uh, who published significantly in the magazine. Uh, one is Raymond Antonius. Uh, uh, I don't know how people in Palestine will pronou pronounce the name, but he was uh, from a Palestinian uh, family. And the other one is Charles Ayrout. And Charles Ayrout was from uh, an Ali uh, family from uh, uh, Aleppo. And these two persons, um, two professionals, uh, did uh, constructed a lot in the 1930s. Uh, um, in Egypt, and both were French trained, but not Beaux Arts trained, which also it's, I think, we haven't spoken of this already, but education, places of um, learning the, the, the trade uh, was uh, also important. And another very important, interesting thing about El Emara is uh, you could, um, through flipping through the pages, uh, you, could, um, you could see the kind of international uh, uh, architecture uh, Egyptian architects were exposed to thanks to the, to the journal. And I, I think this is also uh, quite um, uh, interesting. Um, and this magazine is today uh, online. Uh, no, today's since maybe 15 years now. Um, and this is uh, quite an achievement. And for me, it's all the more in interesting because uh, when I started um, doing my research, uh, in Egyptian modern architecture, uh, no one has ever heard of El Amara. And I remember presenting, for example, at the Faculty of Engineering in, in, in Alexandria and professors of architecture there asking, what, El Amara? 
are you sure? Is it Egyptian? And so no one had ever heard of it. And, uh, and why it, be, it, it, it came online is because uh, I did a master uh, dissertation on it. So it gives exposure to some things, to a source that was not known. So I do believe that research uh, is important in this, um, in this uh, sense because it gives visibility to sources that no one knows. And when they're known, then um, they can be eventually uh, released uh, online. So another important pre prerequisite for the um, online release of an Amara, and it's thousands of pages. Uh, I don't know if people here are aware, but it's thousands of pages uh, which are um, online. Another prerequisite for this uh, online release was infrastructure. In this case, um, it was the platform for ArchNet uh, set up by the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture uh, at MIT, which did the job, the digitization job. And they did the digitization job using the collection of Harvard University that was based at um, Widener. So you, you, you can see the, 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 the actors that, that you need to put together to get this uh, online um, availability. And finally, something that was already mentioned uh, while mention IFPO, uh, we have the chance um, to, to get institutional uh, support for research uh, when we go to the, the Middle East. And in, in Cairo, there are two French centers that can, can help us and uh, host us uh, when we want to do field work. Uh, in um, in Egypt, visit local libraries, uh, local archives, but also in booksellers. And in, in my case, booksellers were probably the most um, uh, useful resource um, uh, to be found in Egypt. So I think academic infrastructure is also very um, important. So from this one story, uh, I would say emerge uh, a kind of virtual virtuous uh, not virtual, virtuous circle uh, required for knowledge produ production to be effective. Um, you need to get hold of new material, and we have seen how difficult it is uh, so far. Uh, we need uh, to support research uh, on this, and then we need to establish sustainable infrastructure um, to disseminate, disseminate uh, data and results. And I, I don't know if you have had this experience, but uh, I have had it many, many times where you find a fantastic website where many things interesting are happening. And then suddenly, boom, it's over. Either you have a, an error appearing or the domain is not you know, uh, paid for anymore. So we really need, I mean, and it's such a waste because you know uh, there is so much energy put on all this and then suddenly it disappears. So I think we have to take this into consideration. So a number of uh, funding instruments are available to that hand at to, to the end of you know, sustainability of the information at national and international level. In my case, I use a lot of European uh, funding that I found uh, quite, in, quite useful, and in particular, a cost, cost action, what was called European Architecture Beyond uh, Europe, uh, that we run from 2010 to 2014. Um, I think George maybe participated in some of the uh, events. Uh, anyway, and but this uh, helped um, more importantly to fund, fund this journal, which is uh, Architecture, Abbey Journal, uh, Abbey Journal, uh, Architecture uh, Beyond uh, uh, Europe, who is now celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary and by no means if you want to publish of course submit to this uh, journal it is published uh, twice um, a year and we're trying to we're trying to build a community uh, around um, it another thing which is uh, I, I have found um, quite uh, useful also and I don't know if it's the case here in Germany um, is uh, the policy of free open access uh, and this has um, as a consequence uh, of this uh, there is a lot of visual 
um, and textual material, often quite rare, that can be found in Cairo, either on this kind of uh, platform, Athar, uh, there, there is more than uh, yeah, 11,000 uh, documents on architecture and the visual arts um, in, uh, in North Africa, in Egypt, I mean, Middle, I mean Egypt and, uh, and, and Maghreb, uh, in particular, uh, but also through Gallica. Uh, I don't know if you, <laughs> you, uh, you know this uh, platform, Gallica, which is the digital library of the National uh, French uh, uh, Library, and uh, they have an ama amazing archive, in particular on Cairo. And this again is uh, very important and interesting, is because they um, got the legacy of an Egyptian collector, Max Karkeji, who lived all his most no half of his life in Egypt and half of his life um, in uh, France, and. Uh, donated his uh, material and because there were so many people interested in this material, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale, without you, we had to do any request or effort, um, did, um, did digitize a lot of his, um, his, uh, his uh, material. So this is also, and it's thanks to this uh, policy of uh, free uh, open um, access. Huh? So, um, to me, at this stage, and after all we, we have heard, is that um, the step forward now is to expand the historical archive. We really need to know more, to locate uh, more, to study uh, more, and to interpret uh, more of uh, these uh, documents. And I know, and this is a discussion we have uh, with Mohammed, a continuous discussion we have with Mohammed. Uh, I mean, going accessing the Egyptian uh, National Archive is not the, <laughs> the most nicest thing. I mean, the difference with other countries is that you have archives everywhere in Egypt, everywhere, just everywhere. Uh, but the point is getting access to per permit to work there in conditions that are not uh, particularly pleasant. That's another um, story. But uh, I still think that we need to open up the archive. We need to expand uh, our capacity of knowing. And I agree, a building is also an archive, but it's on only part. Of, um, of the archives and you know, and it's quite interesting, uh, not for question of authorships, it's not necessarily authorship, but uh, techniques of construction, uh, processes of decision, how the, you know, many, many things uh, uh, can be seen, uh, not only through architectural drawings, but also uh, through correspondence. And when you can have access to those correspondence, uh, we were discussing this with, I mean, of course, it's it's uh, fantastic. But what, what I want to, to, um, to show here, um, also since May, May Tabar could not make it, is that you have local archives as well. Uh, and in this case, I mean, she was interested in this uh, amazing um, German architect who spent all his life, literally most, I mean, he was born in Istanbul, but most of his uh, adult life uh, in Alexandria designing modernity uh, for Alexandrian patrons. Uh, I show you another example uh, here for the Assad family, uh, Assad Basili family in, in, in Alexandria, but he also uh, worked with Lachine Nassar in Alexandria again, but also for the Arida family in, uh, in Lebanon. So maybe there is even documents uh, on uh, Henri Bernot somewhere, um, some places um, in uh, Lebanon. And um, I hope she will be able to make the book she has uh, uh, on mind on this uh, this architect because it's really a kind of photography of modernity uh, in uh, pre and post war uh, Alexandria. And she had to go, I mean, not to go, but she located the document as far as Australia uh, on this uh, architect, because, um, I mean, as many foreigners, he had to leave at one point, and, you know, you leave either for Australia or for Canada or for the US, uh, you know, uh, countries open to immigration. So, uh, yeah, so the, she located the family in Australia and get documents uh, from there. And I think a lot of this work can be done on each of uh, the, the, town, the cities uh, in uh, the region. Another figure that we have also already mentioned several times, and um, 
as uh, George know, I like very much the work of Mahmoud Riyad, maybe more than the work of Said Qurayim, but that's another, I mean, personal taste, you know, this is not debatable, uh, in fact. Uh, but I do, I, I still uh, do think that uh, Mahmoud Riyad, with the designer of so many buildings, um, and town plants in Egypt or uh, also abroad in the Gulf, he really deserves a proper monograph, a proper PhD uh, to start with. Um, and I, I think he also actually wrote his own memoirs. Um, and um, as Said Koraim, he, he, he experienced a kind of, uh, I'm not sure sad, but you know, brutal sort of fate because uh, he was the, um, he became the, the director of the municipality of Cairo at one point. And because of disagreement uh, with Nasser, he just quit and went to uh, Kuwait, I think where he finished uh, his career. So he has a double career, one in Egypt and one uh, abroad. Um, but yeah, I, I think he's a very, very important person. And speaking uh, of diplomacy, I think the, um, the, the guys on the picture that are, have not identified so, so far could be uh, people either from the British or the American embassy. They look very American to me, but I'm not sure. I don't want to be racist. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, I hope one day uh, someone uh, will work uh, systematically on Mahmoud Riyad and this is facilitated, this should be facilitated um, by the fact that uh, the, 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 the studio became a firm and it's already third or fourth generation um, and uh, they have a lot of material, they keep a lot of material these are some of the uh, drawing of a, an iconic building who was, which was burnt uh, during uh, the revolution. Uh, another iconic building, which is not the Hilton anymore, but the the, uh, the Ritz, uh, Mohammed El Fay, the um, you know group. Um, and the, so the family Riyadh architecture are still there. Um, and they post a lot of material. Actually, it's it's amazing. It's just, and you can imagine that if they post this, they might have uh, much more. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a fantastic archive with their awaiting for someone to do a PhD uh, uh, on it. And uh, one can think of uh, many other uh, sources uh, already in the John set um, uh, quoted and while quoted, uh, many ones, um, you know, documentation kept by, by a newspaper, the archives of photographers, um, the portfolios of contractors, uh, the paper of in individual building owners, that of commission commissioning entities. I mean, it was we we mentioned the United Nations many times. Um, I, I, I'm sure they they will have a lot on the region, uh, and also diplomatic of archives, of course. Um, so um, all these or real estate companies, for that matter, also. So all this is awaiting uh, proper research, and I think we can take advantage of our digital world. Uh, to gather much more material and ensure it will be made available to all, thanks of what we can add uh, through research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Um, well, now we will be joined by Mazen Haidar, who's going to be presenting online. Um, Mazen Haidar holds an MPhil in architectural conservation from La Sapienza, I totally didn't say it right, in Rome, and a PhD in architecture from Paris 1. As a practicing architect, he has led and participated in several conservation and adaptation projects of modernist buildings in Lebanon. He has taught since 2011 at various Lebanese and French academic institutions. His publication focus, publications focus on 20th century architectural heritage and the notion of memory in the conservation of residential buildings, which is in line with what he will be presenting today. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation. And thank you again for uh, Georges and Philippe and the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to participate. I will be presenting very briefly, trying to respect the time, the ten, my 10 minutes, um, the latest research, my latest research about island work in Beirut's architecture in the 20th century, published recently in 2021 in the Edition Gutner in Paris. This project owes 
its uh, existence mainly to a pressing need to raise awareness about 20th century endangered architectural heritage in Beirut and in Lebanon, uh, as mentioned before by, uh, by Georges, and the alarming absence of efficient protective tools, those. Although it occupies a marginal place in the history of architecture, ironwork has been placed here at the center of this research as a new tool to discover the urban fabric of uh, Beirut, but also as a symbol of interactions and artistic transfers during the 20th century between Europe and uh, Lebanon. Beirut's heritage presents a rich and very varied legacy that mirrors the expansion of the city throughout the 20th century. If on one hand, the heritage can be discussed or observed through individual building or projects, examples from the independence period. On the other, it can be also approached in a more inclusive manner throughout the entire urban fabric like the city as a whole. For the last two decades, the entire country was wide open real estate speculation. We assisted uh, to the demolition of iconic modernist buildings. Here to the left, we see the Hotel Carton by uh, the Polish architect Karol Shire, mentioned by George Abid previously, and to a lesser extent, the demolition of buildings from the French mandate. Both of these demolitions seems to arouse temporary and very limited indignation without yet triggering a real interest on the part of the authorities to protect this heritage. The rediscovery of the city with its rich heritage has been tackled in this project through ironwork that could be considered as a marginal component at the first glance, as mentioned before, but that turns to be a characterizing and even iconic element of 20th century architecture. Unlike the tendency towards simplifications of facades in residential buildings in architecture of the modern movement in Europe, the use of ornaments inspired by the Art Deco movement in residential buildings in the 1940s and 1950s persisted through ironwork in Beirut. And that until 1955, 1960, with the local development of aluminum production. The survey carried out on the entire city of Beirut focused first on surveying the handrails, an important element of the urban visual identity, giving character to thousands of the balconies of the city. Main doors, an important element in building entrance that is really appropriated by uh, the Lebanese, but also by the flannel, the inhabitants, but also by the flaneurs of the city. Stair railings, a component that is also very quite familiar with all Lebanese, especially in times of crisis uh, with power cuts uh, recently. So rather than focusing on isolated models, the aim of this study was to offer a tool to rediscover the city through different itineraries. The categorization of the 1000 surveyed elements was not based then on aesthetic criteria or on construction period, but instead on their geographical location. The 58 sectors of the city have been distributed into 27 itineraries groups as indicated here through the different colors. Uh, Beirut city center and the southern uh, uh, areas of the city have been intentionally discarded from this research, not because uh, the heritage is less uh, valuable, but first because the city, Beirut city center has been uh, completely transformed uh, during the war and the southern parts were urbanized probably after 1965. In each one of the 27 groups of districts, the survey did not focus on one specific period of the 20th century, but took into account a wide range of buildings constructed between 1900 and 1970. The first category includes then the late Ottoman period and the French mandate. The second includes the period of the independence 1943 until 1955. And the last period is and after 1955, 1955 uh, when local product aluminium starts and with simplified forms were adapted, adopted in road iron works. Here's for example, one of the 27 maps of one specific district. In this case, we are in the area around the harbor that was uh, severely damaged during 2020's explosion. The map indicates the exact location of each building that was surveyed during this research. The numbering can also suggest a certain itinerary to visit the place. Here's another example of a map joining two different districts. And you can see at uh, each one of the chapters, uh, the, the geographical location is uh, well mentioned. 
Well, the many surveyed uh, wrought iron works uh, vary from very elaborate designs that are all locally produced by Lebanese master iron workers to extravagant motifs, like in this example, we have uh, once this, uh, a design uh, presented in 1950 by the very prolific architect Said Hujain to simplified forms such as in the handrails with a dominant horizontality that appeared already in the 1930s in prestigious apartment buildings and again in the 1960s on a broader scale with the decline of the use of ornaments. Since the survey uh, seeks to reconcile small scale of the wrought iron works with the intermediate scale of the architecture and the building and the larger scale of the urban fabric and the city, the location of each surveyed building was not indicated only through a number on the map, but via an inclusive method that is very classic and appropriated in Europe, but not in a country like Lebanon, where even the number of the building has been uh, uh, mentioned here, um, the name of the street, the year of construction, and the name of the architect whenever he was, he was known. Apart from reproducing wrought iron work in this uh, research, the stylistic origins and sources of inspiration have been thoroughly analyzed in the study through a large number of archival documents found in Lebanon and France, such as specialized catalogs and publications widely disseminated around the Mediterranean, uh, documenting the latest production in France, in Paris actually, and in Europe, and that became an essential reference for architects and craftsmen in several Mediterranean countries. Handrails, doors, and separators designed by Parisian decorators, such as Raymond Sub, Gilbert Poirat, Edgar Brandt, Fred Perret, and others, become a reference that was appropriated not only in Lebanon, but also in other Mediterranean countries. One of the object objectives of this research was also to identify the authorship of these different works surveyed in Beirut and to learn about the transfer of the itinerary of these drawings from one geographical context, that is Paris in this case, to the other. Here, for example, to the left, we can see doors that were surveyed in Beirut, and to the right, the source of inspiration, and the medium, the tool, which is the, of this cultural transfer, let's say, which is the catalog, the name of the catalog. The source of inspiration chosen by the architect or the engineer, sometimes by the building owner uh, as well, we don't know exactly, and executed by local master iron workers may be reproduced in a very faithful manner or with some modifications and adaptations. In this particular case on the slide, the inspiration is quite obvious and clearly uh, readable. On others, in this case, the same reference has generated new elaborate designs. We can observe this mainly, uh, this process mainly in the first half of the 1950s in works of architects uh, and engineers, well, mainly architects who graduated from France, uh, such as uh, Elie Boutot, Said Hojel, the architect mentioned previously, Sami Abdelbaki, or others. So starting from a picture published in a catalog, the executed object can therefore acquire new forms and a new meaning in its new geographical context. This is the case, for, any, for example, of some motif extrapolated from furniture pieces published in one of these catalogs and used indoors or railings. It is actually the case of these uh, interlacing uh, systems, patterns that we can see very often, and that seems to have seduced very much uh, Lebanese architects and probably others in other countries. Another interesting aspect of this cultural transfer or voyage of drawings uh, is the fact that unlike Europe, these decorative elements were used both in the so-called luxury architecture or ordinary uh, constructions. While the artistic production has decorated interiors of Parisian uh, uh, bourgeoisie houses for the uh, high society, as the example of, to the left, uh, this elegant decorative grid, in Beirut, to the right, they become more accessible to everyone through entry doors, visible also to passers-by. Architectural ironwork can thus tell a story of inspiration and adaptation, as shown by the other models we have seen previously, with their sources of inspiration, but also a story of emancipation from certain aesthetic canons 
while integrating local subjects, such as those works symbolizing Lebanese mythology, as we can see to the right, with the cedar tree, the symbol of the country, the Phoenician ship, and the legendary phoenix. Uh, to sum up, this research, which uh, proposes ironwork as a key to reading architectural heritage threatened, threatened by demolition, also seeks to reconcile different scales, different levels of reading the city. From the very small scale of wrought ironworks to the intermediate one to the, of the building, to that of the district, or even that of the entire city, understanding the urban evolution and raising awareness for safeguarding this heritage can be still achieved at several levels, each of which deserves to be explored and thoroughly analyzed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mazen. Maybe here I have some immediate questions to Mazen and also to Mercedes. Um, Mazen, I think, um, first of all, it's super interesting the way you kind of create maybe a simple way to put it is like a guide to the city from a very sort of unnoticeable element or from a very kind of different scale than the human usual full size kind of body scale. Maybe my question would be, have you kind of developed this into a guide? Are you kind of like, is what is sort of the, has this been put into pedagogical practice? Are you developing sort of guided ways around the city in which people could really sort of follow the research that you have produced? Maybe I put this question out first and then maybe I ask another. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, <clears throat> as mentioned here, I was uh, describing the work that uh, occurred or that was carried out in this research. And uh, yeah, well, the purpose is that the goal is to invite inhabitants, first of all, to visit their city, because up to now we have been uh, focusing maybe on specific areas of the city of Beirut. Even looking at the architecture was somehow forbidden in some districts. When I say looking, it means that uh, uh, we are uh, putting into question why are we interested in such heritage? Why are you looking at this, uh, this place? Why are we even crossing the street and stopping in front of a building? So it is definitely an invitation to visit the city and to discover it through, uh, through these small elements that are already appropriated by the people. And when we speak about handrails, these are elements that are there uh, that are uh, somehow uh, very, uh, with which people have a, a sort of uh, intimate relationship. So it is not uh, a guide, uh, let's say, uh, the, the purpose of this research is not uh, only to uh, discover the city, but it is also uh, a new tool to read it or to understand it differently, or probably to be, uh, let's say, uh, to have a sort of uh, uh, better understanding of the architecture uh, by uh, people who are maybe not uh, considered as ex experts. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, maybe a question to Mercedes, which is a little bit heavy somehow. <laughs> I think, um, and we could just leave it as an open question, maybe all discuss it kind of later. I think, um, as I heard you present, it also seems that somehow research or the scopes of research are somehow endless and can continue to grow. And somehow that the archive is this ever expanding body that we can sort of over time, keep feeding material into. And I think in relation to what Janset was saying before with this full story, it's as if every time we bring more information, the story is less full versus more full. And I think I just wanted to like hear from you if you feel that these gaps or these, um, these sort of missing links are something that drive the research or is it something that sort of you find, um, yeah, debilitating or interesting and exciting? <sighs> This is like the weight well, of the archive, yeah. Because I'm a researcher, I don't feel, oh yeah, no, not because, but in my case, I don't feel that research is overwhelming or debilitating. I think that at the contrary, um, each time that, that I discover new facts or, um, or yeah, new facts or new, you know, new, new evidence, uh, new stuff, the story is always much more interesting than the one I would have, you know, interpreted uh, with my little mind. Um, so I don't know, um, but this is my own fascination with, uh, you know, with reality and, 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 and history. Uh, I think it's really very, very interesting. And, and you, you, you get an another kind of attachment to, to the thing 
things because you know there is the power of life of of social life because it's not only technical life you know it's the people it's how it, it came into being uh, and i think that yeah it came how it things came into being are really interesting and how they move also because i mean uh, move beyond recognition uh, for example i i used to work in an archive uh, the archive of heliopolis and and we suddenly uh, discovered that what we were seeing today in the street was just buildings that were completely colonized uh, by uh, additions uh, so we could not even you know imagine what it was a bungalow, you know, and it became a building. And uh, so what do you do with this also in terms of inventory? Are you, you know, a bungalow <laughs> becoming a building? Um, so all this for me is really very interesting. Thank you very much. I think we can move on now to the third uh, presentation by Amin al Sadan. Uh, Amin is a curator, educator, and a scholar of art and architectural history whose work focuses on transnational solidarities and exchanges across cultural boundaries. His research explores modern and contemporary art and architecture globally with specific expertise in the Arab and Muslim world. His doctoral dissertation, which is which he is turning into a book, investigated a crucible moment in post-World War II Baghdad, Iraq, when the city became a locus of unprecedented encounters, transforming art and architecture globally, all the while engendering unique local movements. I hand it over. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers, especially George and Philip, for uh, their kind invitation. And sorry that I have no images for you today, which I think is a propo uh, considering my topic. Um, I'll be talking briefly today about my uh, experience, and I want to underline these uh, reflections are based on my experience researching Iraq, because positionality is quite important for my work. Um, and this will partly shed uh, light on my contribution to the book, which is uh, about Qahtan Awni's um, Al Mustansiriya University. Now, admittedly, um, doing research on the modern art and architectural movements of 20th century Iraq um, poses more questions than answers. So I want to start off with three questions here. What happens when archives, especially in the Arab world, reflect the crises that plague this region and post-colonial geographies more broadly since the advent of modernity? We know that state-sponsored archives, when they were established before or after independence, remained either inaccessible or did not necessarily privilege the recording of intellectual output that was often at odds with the oppressive agendas of nationalist politics. Historians working on post-colonial subjects often face a dire reality. Patchy archives, poorly maintained facilities, erratic documentation procedures, uh, circuitous and murky access parameters, and politicized excisions. But what happens when the historical record is subjected to another degree of erasure, namely through the systematic destruction of official archives, as has been the case in Iraq uh, specifically? And what does warfare imply for the kinds of narratives that we are able to write? Iraq has tragically become synonymous with warfare, uh, chronic unrest, displacement, international sanctions, and the general collapse of state sovereignty uh, with inept governments that have been unable to restore even the highly compromised infrastructure and services prior to the American-led invasion in 2003, already in shambles since the 1991 Gulf War and the preceding Iraq-Iran War. Uh, the American invasion dealt a devastating blow to the humble repositories uh, established by successive Iraqi governments over the course of the 20th century. And it was followed by a deliberate burning and looting of museums, libraries, and archives, uh, an enormous cultural loss, the full extent of which we are still uh, really unable to kind of wrap our heads around two decades later. The surviving archives remain either closed or suffer neglect, and there is barely any reliable information about their current status um, and whether they can be accessed uh, by independent scholars until you show up and pull all the possible strings. Um, moreover, what happens to the study of art and architectural movements in Iraq when local historians remain severely under-resourced and when non-Iraqi historians continue to disseminate problematic narratives about the purported uh, superiority of the projects produced by European and American architects? 
or exaggerating these contributions without ever setting foot in Iraq or consulting locals, which I would argue only exacerbates the colonial and neo-colonial violence endured by this region and its populations. Now, rather than dwelling on the incompleteness or loss of official archives, I started reconciling myself with the likelihood that there are gaps uh, we simply cannot fill. I embraced alternative sources that my Western training had discouraged me from considering, uh, such as oral accounts, press coverage, memoirs, private collections, and even artworks and the surviving buildings themselves, if they still exist. I realized that these sources could shift the course of my research and produce equally alternative histories. I found out that a careful interpretation of these non-conventional and typically discredited uh, sources can generate not only more truthful and situated histories defined by the specific reality of the context as well as the agency of local prot uh, protagonists, but also could cross disciplinary boundaries and generate unexpected uh, layered and dense narratives. This has led me to a concept that I call um, the counter archive, which to me designates the alternative evidentiary body, fragmentary, incomplete, fluid, and ever evolving, that might be constituted from material that defy conventional definitions of archives, and which would in turn produce alternative imaginaries and alternative histories. The counter archive serves to combat deliberate erasures, slow down the corrosive effects of time, and assert the possibility of writing histories in places where finding traditional documentation may appear unlikely or even impossible. The counter archive is one that acknowledges and not evades or suppresses the geopolitics that produced hegemonic archival definitions and research practices in the first place and which also resulted in the destruction of repositories in worn torn geographies like Iraq. So by changing our optics, along with our research methods, we can prioritize the narratives that are meant to be weaved and told by the historian and underline the fundamentally constructed and even invented nature of all histories, rather than venerating the traditional archive in and of itself. The new alternative uh, narratives are rooted not only in the complex reality of this part of the world, but also in the fraught nature of the counter archive itself. Now, to sum up, by adopting the concept of the counter archive, I can share two distinct areas in which my research on Iraq has been transformed and really was only made possible. First, oral histories help me refute preconceived ideas about the work and intellectual agendas of the figures that I'm studying, and that my conversations with surviving Iraqi artists and architects uh, revealed to me previously invisible aspects of their practice. Again, this is one of the ways in which the counter archive operates. It elucidates uh, absences and uncovers implausible arguments, generating um, alternative narratives that are in fact more faithful to the protagonist's project and their context. Second, I discovered, again, partly because of these conversations, that local artists had played a crucial and yet rarely acknowledged role in defining the project of fellow Baghdadi architects. Therefore, my project evolved to become fundamentally interdisciplinary, exploring the shared artistic architectural uh, culture that emerged in this context, um, and crossing the boundaries of art and architecture, exploring the affinities, overlaps, and common projects of disciplines that are historically interrelated and yet have become increasingly autonomous since the 19th century. And I must add a third, which is you know, doing uh, more justice to the role of women architects, uh, but I do not want to expand on this because you know, I happen to be writing about an, uh, a man architect in this book. So the counter archive for me uh, is now a metaphor, uh, a methodology and an ethos. Um, but this way of approaching research on Iraq should not obscure the fact that there are serious gaps in the historical record due to the organized violence to which colonized and post-colonial geographies have been subjected. And Iraq continues to be occupied by the US despite what you hear on the news. Um, Scant or non-existent sources result in lopsided global narratives, which further brutalizes places like Iraq, prevented as they are from contending with their difficult past, 
or celebrating remarkable modern accomplishments that may inform their present or future. Thank you. Thank you, Amin. Um, next, we have Susanna Bosch, who will come into this topic on knowledge production from an artistic perspective. Uh, Susanna Bosch is an artist, educator, and independent artistic researcher. She received a PhD, Learning for Civil Society through Participatory Public Art, from the University of Ulster in Belfast in 2012. As an interface activist, Susanna works on long-term questions that deal with concepts and ideas of solidarity, democracy, and commoning in regards to sustainable futures. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, can you see and hear me? Yes. Yes, super. Um, because I'm not so sure, I have to ask Shireen in the background, we had to transform my presentation. If it is possible to, um, you know, have it going from your technical background. Um, if not, I would ask to be postponed. Okay, so maybe. Yeah, maybe we can move to you two first and then we can come back. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I would introduce now BrickLab. <laughs> BrickLab is an award winning Jeddah based architecture studio co founded by brothers Abdurrahman and Turki Gazaz. Their practice probes the boundaries between art, material research, and built environments, merging technical mastery with conceptual rigor and interdisciplinary design. Brick Lab creates architecture for cultural uses, visionary master plans, public space interventions, exhibition scenography, and artistic installations in response to sociopolitical and economic contexts of the work. Right. Is this working? Hello? Yeah. I think they're working. Hi, is this one working? Yeah. Thank you to the organizers and uh, George and Philip for having us uh, speak about our project. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to be presenting to you Saudi Modern, um, um, a research initiative that uh, quickly that uh, quickly evolved into an exhibition in a multidisciplinary <clears throat> format to look at modern architecture in uh, Saudi and its development. Um, just to, before I flip through the presentation, the photo you have here is of Finance Minister Abdullah Suleiman and uh, Standard Oil of California negotiator uh, Lewis Hamilton, um, uh, I forget his name, and um, uh, and this is the signing of the uh, the uh, Aramco concession, and really that starts uh, the so the modern development project in uh, Saudi in general. Uh, this was signed in 1933 in uh, Hosam Palace in uh, Jeddah only a few years after the establishment of uh, the Saudi state. Uh, so Saudi Modern was <clears throat> really a, um, a, a multidisciplinary initiative that started from our uh, uh, interest in uh, understanding uh, our understanding Jeddah, uh, the different <clears throat> architectural uh, periods that the city has gone through and really trying to find a uh, a way to communicate and showcase this uh, to the to both the general public and uh, professionals alike. So th really the project started with uh, Abdurrahman and I taking uh, weekends off uh, to just drive around the city and take uh, photos in an attempt to uh, to archive the different districts and uh, really try to understand the different uh, uh, periods of uh, architecture that are uh, that we encounter on the street. And as you can see here, you have we have buildings that are from uh, in uh, quote unquote informal settlements um, and also very modernist buildings built in the 1940s and 50s all the way to uh, iconic structures uh, that were built and uh, later abandoned. Uh, so 
really uh, after a, a few years of uh, aimlessly uh, roaming the streets, uh, we finally uh, came across uh, a very concise study of uh, Jeddah between uh, 19, conducted between 1959 and uh, 1963 by uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Makhlouf. Uh, Abdul Rahman Makhlouf is an Egyptian uh, urbanist and architect um, appointed by the United Nations Development Program um, in, uh, to, uh, to create a, uh, an urban strategy for, for the nation. Uh, what Abdul Rahman Makhlouf uh, was tasked was to look at uh, the different urban centers across Saudi uh, and also uh, and provide you know, uh, overall strategies, but also commissioned to provide a uh, a comprehensive master plan for uh, the city of Jeddah in uh, particular. Um, and so really looking at the, uh, that as the ending point for our research and looking at 1938 when when um, when Aramco uh, discovered um, uh, Dammam well number seven and uh, really uh, you know, increase the economic prospects of the country. Uh, so really during that period, uh, Jeddah uh, uh, witnessed unprecedented growth. Um, the city grew from a small walled town into um, a sprawling urban uh, metropolis. Uh, it grew 10 times in size uh, in that uh, uh, almost 25 year period. And, and it just to add to that, um, just for, for you who don't know, um, Jeddah is a port city that leads to both Mecca and Medina and also um, is a gateway to all of the trade, a lot of trade routes uh, in terms of spices and, uh, uh, and such. And I think this, this really gave the city a very unique identity in terms of its architectural uh, merit. Uh, we have a lot of different styles because we had a lot of unknown uh, architects that have been building there, but that have come from different parts of the world and ended up infusing the city uh, with various architectural styles, uh, both from, uh, well, I think I would more or less say from an international standpoint, but really, it really resonates when you go to Beirut, you go to Egypt, you go to a lot of Arab cities, you really see that resonance and similarity. And it's very, very specific to Jeddah more than the rest of Saudi. So, and we both come from Jeddah. And we decided to start this initiative <laughs> from Jeddah. <laughs> it's easy to drive around. Yeah. <laughs> so really, I mean, uh, but overall, once we started to really dig deep into um, uh, the research, we started to realize that uh, for us, uh, Jeddah cannot be isolated from um, uh, the surrounding, uh, from from the surrounding uh, cities, and uh, obviously the capital as well. Uh, and I think. <clears throat> One of the really uh, our long-term ambition, I guess, is to uh, take Saudi modern from uh, Jeddah and expand it into uh, other urban centers uh, across the country. So we have a, uh, a fuller uh, idea of what was really going on during this period, uh, which is uh, surprisingly very um, understudied in general. And I think this this approach also um, kind of really resonates with with the rest of what uh, everyone has spoken about today. With it really encourages us to to keep doing what we're doing because for us this overly ambitious plan to go over five different cities and hopefully more in the future really is about to create a collective archive um, where we could uh, start create, building a network with different architects from different parts uh, of the country to to alleviate or to strengthen uh, the database that we have. So I will really. Um... Uh, after almost three years of uh, conducting research, a lot of it happened obviously during um, uh, COVID, uh, perfect context to uh, you know go online, uh, do a lot of reading, uh, visit, um, uh, acquire uh, books. Um, and so really the, uh, what we really wanted to do was to, uh, we ended up uh, creating a paper um, and this paper, uh, we quickly wanted to, <clears throat> We were thinking of how best to uh, communicate it with the general public and uh, uh, professionals in the city. So that really took shape in three different, uh, let's say, three different sub projects. Uh, one of it was the uh, the renovation of a uh, 1950s villa in one of the first suburbs outside of the walled city, um, and. Uh, 
an, ex an exposition of the architecture of, of architecture and urbanism during this period. And, uh, and the experimental part here was to uh, um, <clears throat> was to introduce the topic to uh, uh, contemporary artists and really find ways to start to bridge the gap between the historic content and our uh, contemporary uh, condition. In a way, it also becomes like a, the counter archive we were talking about. How do you collect data in that way? So we really wanted to, uh, although we were collecting a lot of information, how do we also bring something different to the table um, that would enrich our knowledge as well from different people's perspectives? I think um, the house itself obviously becomes the main protagonist. Um, we were actually able to, to access um, a house to, to the generosity of the families uh, and, and the patrons that were able to support us. And also got to Institute, uh, actually one of the main uh, supporters as well. Um, but it was, it was really fascinating to actually not only collect data, but be working in a house that has been abandoned for about 40 or 50 years or so. Um, and the whole family had to vote in on how we should use it, should they, um, um, demolish the house after the exhibition, should they keep it as a testament to itself, they decided to keep the house after the renovation, which is an achievement in itself. And it really, for us, um, this, this form of exhibition that, that takes a, an experiment, an experiential part, and also um, um, a written part or, or kind of an archival uh, library, um, really becomes or at least for us, we're trying to portray the idea that these houses can be used. Other people's houses in different parts um, of the Arab region can be used in different ways and reused. And I'm sure, and this is something I'm excited to hear about, I think tomorrow by the end of the day, uh, is this adaptive reuse. And I think one of the other things is that it uh, really um, invites residents from different districts of the city uh, to visit uh, one of these uh, one of these neighborhoods that's been really um, uh, marginalized um, over uh, the past uh, thirty yeah. or uh, forty years. Obviously, our intervention, just to not to dwell on this too long, was to simply superimpose walls uh, so they can always be removed, uh, and the house would go back exactly to what it was. We simply added a planter. Uh, in one of the spaces just to kind of instigate this notion of is it a garden, is it a lobby, how do you uh, interweave the experience of a residential home uh, into a curatorial or an exhibition uh, narrative. And everything was done very, very simple. We just uh, uh, introduced, reintroduced electricity and water into the house and just cleaned up the garden a little bit. Everything was super simple. We didn't paint any of the walls except for one of the artists. Um, so it was truly, I mean, the experience itself of compiling the data and working on the house and working with the artists was really something that I think enriched uh, the, entire, the entirety of the research and, and probably the curatorial brief that went into the book. Uh, in terms of uh, really uh, creating content for uh, or displaying the uh, urban de development component, uh, what we had was a very extensive survey of the city uh, that really portrays what it looked like uh, in 19, uh, 1962 by the time Abdurrahman Makhlouf concluded his studies. Uh, so we managed to get a copy of that uh, survey and we worked with uh, university students and, and uh, recent graduates to uh, retrace uh, the uh, the, the plans that are, uh, strangely enough, uh, published by the local municipality, but the local municipality didn't have uh, any copies. Uh, they were uh, misplaced or destroyed. Um, and uh, I actually managed to get the copy from uh, Abdurrahman Makhlouf himself uh, and uh, <clears throat> really uh, uh, scanned everything and then worked with the students to digitize it. And then we worked with, uh, we did a, a two week workshop where we made concrete molds and uh, created tiles uh, that really show uh, the extent of uh, the city during that time. Uh, and in addition, we also look, uh, did a, um, 
a survey of uh, 13 buildings. Uh, we narrowed down uh, these buildings based on their uh, the period of their construction, their construction material, and uh, how they kind of really uh, fall in that transitional period from the local uh, vernacular um, construction methodologies into um, reinforced concrete and um, and again, we had no access to any plans or any virtually anything uh, from from any um, governmental body. So we again, we engaged with students to to go to the site through photogrammetry um, and and generate content ourselves. So all of this uh, is an aim for us to generate to generate content that's missing, but also to find and gather uh, new bits of information. Um, so what we again, following on that kind of counter archive what we wanted to do is to mon monumentalize these buildings uh in a way that they're screen printed uh kind of nice looking posters that someone can actually buy and that could remain in their home and that could generate a future conversation beyond the uh the extents of the exhibition or the book itself so it could be um a a, a dinner table conversation that could instigate something that could save this house or retrieve some information. So we kind of want to give a life to the archive uh, beyond its, um, its archival format in a way. Uh, and the, uh, the third component uh, working with the contemporary artists was really an eye opener because uh, with each artist kind of looked at the, the paper and was, insp was, was inspired or uh, but the urge to research a certain aspect of uh, life during this period and really tried to trace out uh, some of the continuities between what was happening uh, then and um, what's happening now. And uh, what was interesting is the themes that we can see recurring from that early uh, modernization uh, period and how, they, and how some of these themes uh, still follow through uh, until today. Uh, the artists that we worked with were most, um, uh, coincidentally, uh, many of them are trained as architects, so they do have that interest in the built environment, um, and also uh, from different parts of the country and the region, so that so we can also look at the the geopolitics of of uh, of uh, of Jeddah within uh, the wider context. And that sort of um, translated uh, at this point into uh, a, a self-published uh, exhibition uh, catalog, uh, which includes the sort of the curatorial uh, essay. And uh, but what we are really uh, asp uh, aspiring to is to have a <clears throat> a, a book on uh, Saudi modern, looking at all of the different cities um, once we have that uh, once we start to move ahead with that long-term agenda. That infiltrates the educational system as well, and people can start learning about it because we also taught at the university, and every time we refer to a project in a specific context in Jeddah, students would still go back and look at European uh, modernist architecture. And it's just like, why don't you look around the area, <laughs> the, co the direct context of the site you're given? So I think it, it, there are many, many different facets um, of, of why we're doing this. Uh, but it's definitely to, to enrich this conversation that we're all having today, I think, or we hope. <laughs> and I think can we just uh, to conclude, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, you, if you, any of you are familiar with what's happening in uh, Jeddah this earlier this year. But uh, over the past um, over the past six months, there has been a, a massive uh, urban renewal project where um, many of the districts that were documented um, in this uh, research were actually um, were all uh, flattened out to make room for uh, future developments around the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Old Town. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, that encouraged us to keep doing this is that. <clears throat> this this project really gave us a platform or a voice to communicate uh, the value of uh, these districts, some of these examples of the architecture. Um, and what you have uh, on the right here is a, a document that we uh, uh, managed to submit to the Ministry of Culture and the local municipality uh, to, to save, uh, to preserve some of the buildings in these districts and really giving them some of the background information, which is 
um, a lot of it is uh, is uh, oral histories um, and mostly uh, his, um, historic photographs of uh, these buildings. And one thing that uh, we were successful in doing is we saved, you know, we submitted around <laughs> 40 buildings. We saved, managed to save four so far. <laughs> so uh, we really hope that this uh, research effort can really uh, influence the built environment uh, as well. Thank you. Um, I think, Susanna, the presentation should be working now. Yes, okay. It works okay, because I can't see it. It will be a continuous slideshow, a continuous presentation of images. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, um, thank you, George and Philip, and as well, a big thank you to Pilin Tan, who connected me to this conference. I'm an artist and um, I will speak about the Arab Development Society in the Jordan Valley from a perspective of knowledge production from um, an artistic point of view. Um, and the images will just go on and on and on while I speak. Uh, they come from, uh, that we're dealing with four types of images, historical images, collected footage, uh, images that I took around, um, 10 years and onwards ago, uh, exhibition views and images from publications. Um, so in 2012, I responded to an open call and was invited alongside with four other artists, actually one of them is an architect, um, to the city's exhibition 2012. And the city's exhibition is um, up to now a series of five exhibitions on Palestinian cities created until now by uh, Yazid Anani. And it was initially in, in, initiated by Vera Tamari. And um, um, it's a series of exhibitions and explorations and research journeys that actually looks at um, navigating away from preconceived stereotypical perceptions of Palestinian cities uh, towards a contemporary view, a contemporary perception of a city in Palestine and urban space in general. So um, um, this particular invitation to Jericho was an interesting one for me because it, it already included the idea of uh, research. It was set up in three phases. Um, the invitation was to spend time, to then um, um, come up with what we called a notebook, which was the first written documentary or visual and written documentary on what we were exploring. Then um, we were all invited to um, um, set up um, um, an intervention, or it was also called a Jericho walk. So something where the public could take part and it, um, the concept ended with an exhibition at the Biazet Museum, um, where the whole project was also kind of, that's the home institution of this um, format. And um, within that format, I was assigned to look at um, broadly speaking humanity, which included architecture, history, archeology, span arch uh, agriculture and ethnology. And, that very much resonated with what um, um, I was working on. I am still constantly working on. Um, I am ongoingly interested and fascinated around the question of sustainable ways of living and working, both in rural and urban places. And I've been through the years looking at um, sites, institutions, individuals who um, who come up with viable alternatives to capitalist models of you know, private accumulation. So with that lens on, I started being in place, being in Jericho and uh, the Jordan Valley. And um, in terms of an artistic methodology, this being in place, I really want to name as one of the methodologies because um, artistic research has a lot to do with um, at least to my definition, because there's various definitions. Um, so this is, it's a journey of not yet knowing. And 
one way of getting to know is um, to embody yourself within a situation, which means to kind of um, try for what you would call a sensual and physical knowledge gain, or also you could also say it's it's a way of yeah really um, sensing or getting knowledge through um, uh, perception perceptions of various ways so uh, beyond intellectual perceptions and uh, desk based studies it is really about being in place so um and um that leads right away to the next methodology and um one presenter uh John said in the last panel already mentioned she called it the impact of chance i would call it um the methodology of coincidence and um, in german it's called zufall uh, falling in place which for i can say now 30 years i really um realized that this is a method of um uh, allowing topics uh, and, and knowledge to arrive so while being in place, I started looking at sewage, water. I was quite open in terms of what is it that I'm going to concentrate on. I looked at farming. And then really by coincidence, I met on the streets um, a woman, uh, Siham Fayyad, who um, invited me after speaking for after a couple of minutes to um, come and visit her the next morning, 6 a.m. at her workplace. And it turned out she was the administrator of the Arab Development Society and not only the administrator, um, she also grew up um, within the Arab Development Society because her parents are uh, refugees from Gaza and arrived in the 60s and so um, as a Bedouin woman from Gaza, the ADS was uh, not only her workplace but her home and arriving there I realized immediately and this is where I think um, the building or the compound becomes evidence of an of of um, something much larger that slowly unfolded I arrived at something that at first hand one could have read in 2012 as a um, a farm dairy farm, lots of Frisian cows standing in the desert. Um, and it, will be, it became quite obvious that they are producing um, uh, large amounts of dairy for the West Bank. Um, uh, dates, uh, then in the course of time, I learned that there's also a research project on fishes for Palestine, uh, especially for the West Bank. And um, composting was also another project going on. So it looked like a rural farm situation, but, and that was also somehow phrased in the last panel, um, building as evidence. In this case, it's compound as evidence because pretty quickly I realized this is far more than, um, than a farm. It has an architectural structure and uh, lots of derelict or dormant buildings. I would like to call it more dormant than derelict. So and then I learned through Siham that there has been um, a school, uh, a library, um, uh, a dormitory, uh, workshops. And um, so over the course of time, and this is where um, a next methodology comes in, being present and allowing coincidence to, yeah, in this case, uh, have a, a person arrive in my life. Um, uh, um, Relational, uh, you know, relational practice starts. Uh, somebody early on called that, um, you know, the power of social life. So, what I then um, got access to was really the invitation to um, get to know people who work on the farm, who are part of the board, um, who have grown up there, um, um, and all of that through. Um, um, I mean, it started with Siham, but it became a whole web of people who somehow as experts of that place and also a specific history um, felt, I don't know, felt, uh, somebody called it earlier on, uh, felt ambassadors of the history and actually the meaning of this place. So I had the pleasure to discover um, that this Arab Development Society uh, was set up by Musa Alami in the 1940s, late 1940s, and went through a whole phase of transformations from an initial idea to strengthen the farmers uh, and um, civil society of Palestine to that war situation where the farm 
was set up under unbelievable geopolitical circumstances and uh, was set up actually with a, a group of refugees because by that time 1.5 million Palestinians were uh, displaced and um, coming through the Jordan Valley. So, so um, um, Musa Alami kind of found his alliance in this group of people and set up um, the Arab Development Society quite outside of Jericho towards the Dead Sea on a piece of land that was um, uh, called to be um, non-viable for farming because of its high degree of salt or to be precise of potash. And um, the opposite turned out once they found water, so they digged for six months, um, it became an extremely fertile piece of land because pretty much everything grew. And so um, they were able within the first three to four years to build 64 houses, um, a number of dwells, um, everything basically, according to the reports that they grew, flourished, worked. So, um, um, and I got to know about all of this through um, people who told me about it, but then also I, I had access to the buildings. So I could enter um, uh, the offices, but also the locked up places. I went into the library, things that were, I mean, literally dormant is the right expression for it. And I got to see, um, I, I found uh, footage in cupboards, like audio, video, um, not video, audio, Super 8 films, uh, slides, books in the dump, I found school books. So somehow the whole story of what had happened here through the years unfolded through people, material, and um, um, which also then led to a form of research. Of course, we talked a lot about um, archiving right now, kind of looking at what stories are there, like have been captured so far. And it also led to access uh, because I started speaking to people and finding people who've been working there also in this or being growing up there as orphans who gave me access to their private um, photo albums and narratives. And um, as an artist, what I then did is a physical transformation of that type of knowledge because I was highly excited about um, a place and let's say a, a drive behind that place that was all about transforming um, Palestinian society and um, A through setting up um, a farm but also then um, beside the farm uh, putting up a, um, a, a school that was all about vocational training meaning the orphans that at the end of the day, male orphans lived there and grew up, were all trained in um, all learned craft, all were um, committed um, to be working the land collectively. And um, the whole educational program was a lot about an embodied connection to the land. So very physical, lots of exercises. Um, and I researched about this type of education, which has a lot to do with a German way of collectively connecting to land and to each other um, as, as, as a form of, um, yeah, kind of um, educating for societal role where you are part of the commons. And um, um, to sum this up, because my time is up, um, um, for me, transforming this into artworks meant um, uh, I used the trail, the invitation of a walk to uh, do a nocturnal um, walk uh, from the Ein Duke um, spring to, um, to the ADS. Uh, and the 70 people who joined for this silent walk, um, none of them had ever been on this farm. So it was giving access to a place that not only to me was quite unknown that it exists, um, it also led to an exhibition uh, and various exhibitions since then where I transformed uh, material into installations or film. Um, um, it led to text-based work um, and to various uh, conversations, for example, with Salim Tamari, a sociologist, where we uh, both kind of um, try to discuss or you know, expand to the audience these questions of why has this never become a, a larger movement, but state an individual um, attempt to uh, transform society, um, um, 
um, also reasons of, you know, is, is there, um, I mean, I said now for two times, it felt like a dormant place for me. I saw lots of potential uh, workshops, space, uh, um, a school building, all empty, uh, kind of imagining right away what potential it would have for nowadays um, question of how to create um, a transformative society, a commoning moment. So for me, it, it, it showed all that potential uh, when I discovered it. And um, um, there's various reasons why the school finished at some point in the 90s and the farm went on. Um, maybe something for a discussion later. And I'm also glad to know that Pelin Tan and Dima Yasa, I think, take the Out of Development Society tomorrow um, as part of you know, that they refer to that place and project in their presentation. So there will be more in-depth um, um, discussion around what was set up in this place through a specific type of architecture that was to, there to serve um, an idea of a model society, one that would be sustainable in the future, despite being occupied and war and all these uncertain conditions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Um, I think maybe I would already open it up here to questions from the audience or from the other panelists. Yes, there is a question there. I think a microphone is on its way. Just a very quick question to Susanna. So thank you so much, actually, for all of you. This was a very uh, inspiring session. So Susanna, could you tell us maybe just one sentence about why the school stopped and the farm remained. Sorry, I'm too curious. No, no, it's, there's various reasons. Um, what I learned is in 91, um, the number of students decreased. Um, uh, very practical reasons. Um, since it's far out, it was connected to a boarding situation and many of the families wouldn't send their kids uh, to a school far away from home because they needed them to work and stay at home and maintain uh, family economics. That was one reason. And the second reason was um, um, the Palestinian educational uh, department, of course, developed a, an educational curricula. And this was in a way like a parallel type of education and wasn't really um, supported as a, as a parallel way of yeah, um, education, as I just said. So two reasons. And at some point there were more teachers than students, I was told, and that was the moment where they decided to not uh, continue. Yeah, I, I can, can uh, have several questions, but I would like to pose one right now. Uh, I think that we have in quite a bit of the things which have been presented a focus on the question on the visual. And so I think on the one hand, um, uh, uh, our guest from MAMA, uh, you and also Mazen, uh, uh, the, 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 and, and Susanne, uh, the approach to get to the research subject is by uh, uh, strolling around the city. So it's not, the origin is not any kind of text document or uh, so, but you kind of put yourself in the location and you search for the things you're looking for which is, I think, not, not a typical way to do research, an interesting way. And the second is, which is, uh, of course, uh, of, not so surprising, the context of architecture, that there is also a strong meaning of visual production. So you not only work with the found visual material like an art historian would do, uh, so you made an emphasis that the, the way you kind of put, present these drawings as posters in a, almost, I don't know if it's correct to say, almost fetishizing the objects, uh, but also Mazan kind of redraws kind of, to, kind of in an analytic way, but he makes like a kind of a inventory, which has kind of also certain graphic quality. And uh, Susanna also, of course, uh, kind of works in a different way, producing visual material. But I think that's something which is not, if you speak about academic uh, 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 knowledge and academic research, which is kind of specific. 
So maybe you can say a little bit, a uh, few words about this, uh, of the relationship of text-based work to uh, this kind of uh, approach. Um, I think for us, it's um, it's always a question of how do we document that? with With the exhibition that's gonna happen in Riyadh, there's already a lot of information. So um, in that context, monumentalizing these buildings wouldn't really be necessary because all of that information is available and there's a lot more attention given to modern architecture in the capital. Um, but I think um, also to kind of add yet another layer of, of documenting, um, uh, we worked on uh, on a few projects before where we tried to archive Jidda through actually going to certain sites um, and just spilling silicone on the ground and capturing uh, the texture of that. Um, for us, it's it's interesting that you say that it's, it's kind of artistic, but for us, it's purely, it's almost like capturing a scripture or kind of, you know, as kids, we used to do it over a coin. Uh, so how do you really, um, it's, it's really a rhetorical question, the way that we're doing these things is it, it, it kind of, I mean, we can open this up as a rhetorical question. How do you archive? How do you capture the essence of something? Is it through, when, when we did the spill on the ground, it's really to get people to look at the texture of the ground. Um, and I think with Mazin, it's looking at these um, facets um, with Susan. It's, it's, it, each one brings, brings something different to the table. Um, but I think it's, it's really shifting how we can accumulate these bits of information and then collate that, or maybe it will have a different value at some point in the future. So it's also kind of a question of, of what's the value of the archival material itself. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. And I think just when on the relationship uh, between the sort of the, the visual object um, and the text, I think, <clears throat> Uh, what we really uh, wanted to emphasize is that you know this historical content content should not just be a, a history that is um, uh, that is not living a history that is uh, that remains in the book or takes on a nostalgic um, uh, meaning and in the, by utilizing these techniques uh, these visual uh, representations or uh, texture uh, representations um, and even I think the project to you know renovate the exhibition space in itself, uh, in our case, was in a way for us to, uh, you know, bridge that gap between the, uh, the, you know, the didactic form of the text and an experiential, um, uh, and to build an experiential uh, conversation uh, with this historical content. Um, Susanna, would you like to add something? Yeah, Mercedes said in her talk, she spoke about um, uh, research or archives in general, giving visibility to knowledge. And I was just thinking, I'm quite aware that artistic research is um, can be a very contested field in terms of, um, you know, standing, let's say, in, next to or in the field of academic research in, in um, um, as something that is has arrived recently and um, um, and kind of puts the doing or the, the process, um, a kind of um, sensory or emotional perception equally to a thought process into the field. So um, I would always say, ideally it aligns, you know, the, that language of making knowledge visible or, um, and, um, allowing an experience to uh, to with knowledge uh, um, in a line with in line with also um, an intellectual or academic understanding of um, the content. So I'm uh, let's say I am um, always highly excited to see both things happening. And for example, in this case, I am more than curious to learn about. Um, uh, Dimas and Palin's perspective on the ADS from uh, different fields of expertise. Mm, Mazen, would you like to add something or should I? Yes, actually very briefly because uh, just mentioned that probably working on uh, 
uh, the visual experience is uh, not very common, but the context is not very common. The context is very different, actually. If I'm focusing on Beirut, for instance, or Palestine, or maybe, well, let's focus on Lebanon. In this case, we have been uh, practically deprived from our geographical context and geographical affiliation with our city. So um, at uh, the start, uh, the uh, let's say, uh, exploring, exploring the place or exploring uh, the city in general or the architecture through uh, uh, the immediate experience we can have with the gaze, with the visit, uh, can be, let's say, a new base that can be sometimes reconciled with the academic and research and uh, the archives and whatever we're trying to do in Lebanon. Uh, the itinerary itself or visiting a place itself has been uh, an act. Uh, I mentioned that before, but I think that that is very important that we can work a little bit more and focus uh, more on this combination of the days uh, of reading. And this is what has been already said about how we can match or how we can combine these little items to each other. Um, and I, I believe that uh, working on the small scale in, in our countries, and especially in, let's focus on the Middle East, Palestine included in Lebanon, or probably Jordan and Syria, uh, can be uh, somehow uh, way more appropriated by the people and the people living uh, uh, in our countries. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions in the crowd? So if there is not, I have a maybe maybe a difficult one uh, because the question of the, the the role of Western institution in knowledge uh, on our subject. Uh, so George and I, when we looked out for people who might contribute to the project, have been really sensitive about the, the also the question who and, and George more than me, I have to admit, but uh, we, we have been bo both sensitive about the question who is uh, doing the work. And there was an interest uh, to have people who somehow speak about their culture. Anyhow, you see, you know that it's a little bit mixed, and then sometimes it's not, there is not such a clear identity uh, in in this question. But it is also, I think, pop, uh, was pretty obvious that uh, even so, we uh, have been sensitive for that and looked out for people. Also, some of the people we engaged used to be from these countries, but moved to, like, I mean, you're now in Canada, yeah, or uh, Mohammed is in Mexico, I see, or I don't know where you are right now, and <laughs> uh, so they are not more there, but they moved to, um, so Mexico is not explicitly Western, but Canada is, and, and, and so on. So what is the meaning of that? I mean, I mean, there is of probably kind of, I mean, we are challenging Western uh, art history or Western architectural history. And then there is nevertheless kind of, still kind of a relevant role by Western institutions. Um, what does it mean? <laughs> the question is for me. Yeah, no, for everybody. I mean, we are all, I mean, we are all in this case. <laughs> well, the, the, I should have started saying that I'm not Egyptian, uh, which is <laughs> obvious from my name, uh, or almost obvious from my name. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure being of the place, whatever that means. Uh, helps always with research, may, maybe with visual perform, performance. Um, but I think that when, uh, when you are from that place or really, really close to that place, uh, they are things that you might not see. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, that would be interesting, for example, a workshop with, you know, uh, foreigners going to Jeddah and being, you know, uh, strolling in the streets and yeah. maybe telling you, ah, oh, and what is this? And what is this? Because for you, it's so familiar. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, yeah. So I mean, this is true, but then we should ask, we should get more Egyptians or Syrians to study uh, uh, classical German architecture. 
<laughs> no, and, and this I, I agree also. And this again, it, it's a matter of, you know, I don't know, uh, 50 years ago, one of the best professors in France in French literature was Egyptian. Okay. And um, other, at the contrary, were working in Cairo University. And today with this, it's not the same anymore. And you have identity politics and you have all this. And, and there is, I, I don't know, I think, yeah, I, I think that both things, I mean, it would be very interesting to get you guys, I don't know, work in Delhi or, yeah. or, or Paris, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's so I, I think we should be more diverse and more uh, with this, not only if only Lebanese are interesting in are interested in Lebanese heritage, if only Saudis are interested in Jeddah, if only, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of world we will be building through this, but I mean, maybe, can I I jump know, in, maybe I mean, you have another take on this. I mean, I, I don't want to push back on this, uh, but I do think there is something to be said uh, for lived experience, right? And I think um, what Philip is saying is also, it's funny that, you know, we in the Arab world are told, you know, oh, we're too close to the subject. Maybe you need a foreigner to do the work for you. No, 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 no. But no, no, but like no one in Germany, for example, would say, oh, maybe a French would know this better than we do because they have the distance, right? So it's kind of like, we have to be kind of at least consistent about the standards. Now, I wanna say just from, again, personal experience, I'm forever uh, grateful for my Western education and privilege really. Uh, but I have to say that it was actually in my second or third year of my PhD, uh, very close to abandoning my project because I realized I'm like, what the hell am I writing about without an archive, right? Um, and I was sat down by uh, Professor Sibel Bosdogan, who again, I'm infinitely grateful for. And she said, forget everything you learned and go to Baghdad and speak to living architects and artists. And it was actually by suspending my Western education that I was able to do that work. I have to also say that because of my time now living in Canada for almost four years, it's been incre like incredibly humbling to actually learn from the indigenous communities of Canada in acknowledging my positionality my relationship to the place, to the work that I do, um, and understanding again that, yes, it is problematic for somebody like me to be sitting in Canada working on Iraq, but at least, you know, in the case of Al-Mustansiriya University, I actually literally grew up on that campus. My mom was a professor there, and um, I have at least that experience, and I've done extensive work um, talking to the living protagonist, trying to access archives, et cetera. So doing, you could say, what really rigorous and responsible Western historians might do um, with the added advantage of my knowledge of culture and language and lived experience. Um, but again, I'm not saying it's black and white. I do fully appreciate the work that Mercedes does. No, no, like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm saying this generally and I appreciate the work that, you know, in the morning when I made my comment, I appreciate the work of Lukas and Apaniota, uh, but I do think that acknowledging our positionality and our um, blind spots is extremely important. Um, if I can just quickly add to that, I think uh, there's something uh, that's quite interesting that you both are saying, and I think for us, um, and I'm kind of speaking for the both of us, but maybe we can interject. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, we we were both born in Jeddah um, during kind of uh, this high modernity period. Um, grew up with video games and whatever, so we were uh, highly exposed to Western civilization from home. But then we have both. Uh, went uh, to Montreal in Canada. I then moved on to Bristol. So we kind of, we each kind of got our own Turkey study history and theories, very, very Western um, uh, kind of influence. But I think only once we were detached from that context entirely, but knowing it at heart and going back again, you kind of get to see these things from a fresh perspective. Um, and I think that really, um, 
gave a lot of meaning to the work that we've done. And I only say that because of the recognition we'll be able to get, to be able to be here uh, with you all, to be able to be given a house to do an exhibition. It's just uh, these different interactions with different people really give you the strength to keep going and to really know that we think um, we, we've been so far detached and we're back looking at it again and questioning and being super critical about what it is and how we can really give back to the community, I think. Um, Susanna, I see that you have a comment, but I think there was something in the audience. First. Yes, yeah. please, I've been trying to yeah. interject, but been ignored. It's okay. Uh, so, uh, so thank you so much for this question. It's very uh, timely. I mean, it's a debate that we find in literature who has the right to write about the story of a minority group. I mean, do you need to be a part of that, that you know, like minority to, to, uh, have to be legitimate at telling that story? Um, and I, I mean, one of the consensus, current consensus in movie, in literature, in investigative um, journalism is that the word, the art word and the cultural word would be much poorer if we limit, let's say, that uh, production to people from that place. However, that being said, in our field of architecture that I can speak of, I totally agree with Amin that uh, we are today in still in a state in a post-colonial uh, condition in my country, Morocco. Sorry, I'm Aziza from Morocco. Um, it is still extremely present. I mean, please, how many, let's say, experts on Le Corbusier are from Morocco? None, right? But how many experts on Moroccan only um, colonial if modernism exists, many, right? So, and, and, and exactly like I mean, I mean, who is French person or German person would say, oh, let's call an Algerian, you know, to research this topic because they have the distance to enlighten us. It never happens. And even let's acknowledge it today, this conference is funded by whom? By the Goethe Institute, right? So let's say that this condition continues. I mean, it's the situation we have is the elephant in the room. Uh, I'm myself, I'm educated, I'm highly uh, privileged, uh, you know, ed uh, educated in two Ivy Leagues in the United States. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto. And so, sure, I am a product of my own experience being born and raised in Morocco and this, uh, you know, let's say Western education. I'm back now in Morocco. Uh, only to, you know, acknowledge this very complex uh, situation that, um, Certainly, the cultural production on architecture and else is much richer by having many perspectives and by actually having a dialogue. But this dialogue is unbalanced. It's unbalanced because a question of funds, between a question who is leading the narrative. I mean, uh, just in Morocco, uh, most of the research is done on colonial. Uh, you know, French heritage, there is no funding for post-colonial. That's many people, I won't acknowledge which architecture historian, uh, state that modernism, the great work of modernism in Morocco stops at uh, independence, uh, totally unfounded, but that's another discussion. So in any case, a part of me is extremely upset uh, at this um, situation. And I think only us from the Arab world actually can stand up and actually engage in a more balanced dialogue, but you guys also have to acknowledge this situation and engage in a more balanced dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, there are a few comments in the audience and I think also Susanna was raising her hand for a while, but maybe we take one there first. Um, okay, yeah. a quick comment, uh, maybe. Uh, I think we also need to acknowledge the diversity of Western research and approaches to um, the academia and how globalized it has become. So, uh, for example, I'm a Jordanian. I did my PhD at uh, UCL in London. So um, I own that I also contributed to, uh, via my research to the, um, let's say, British or the UK um, academic research. Like now with this, my, with our collaboration, I'm also contributing to the uh, German understanding of the Arab world. So we also have to own it and not just kind of um, have a second role. So we do have a first role and we need to acknowledge it. And for example, um, I'm, I, I wasn't able to relate to this positivist view of archival research very well, because for example, while uh, researching the sports city, even if I found like very generous archival material, 
I wouldn't dream of uh, talking just about that without actually going to the real building. So I think the diversity of different disciplines and this kind of cross-pollination of approaches in different disciplines enriches um, our mutual understanding or our collective understandings of uh, especially modern heritage. If it was ancient heritage, uh, maybe we could we would just have the archive, but modern heritage is still here with us. So people are part of it and we need to kind of um, um, have a cross-disciplinary and um, diverse approach to that. Thank you. Maybe as the mic travels down to George, Susanna, you can jump in if you want to. I think there's George and yeah. there, yeah. I'm also, I just want to say I'm extremely grateful for that question because I am, um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, here I was a German in Jericho, I mean, no, white, female, European, I mean, this whole issue of privilege and um, a kind of still post-colonial move going on, it's, um, yeah, nodding. Um, and I, I can just say, thanks God, I have a sense, at least in Berlin, I can sense how these things are shifting and changing in terms of um, um, different types of, let's see, people, invitations and voices getting involved. But I was also just thinking, being there, I mean, back then I was based in Northern Ireland. Um, so I, um, and let's say, well, It's a very personal thing, but it has a lot to do, I find, with um, that position of being the outsider in a situation and, um, uh, let's say, being invited in. Um, Siham, for example, and I think this is something about maybe a type of female exchange and bonding, ended up inviting me to stay with her because it was really difficult to get accommodation in, in Jericho over a longer period of time. So I became part of her family actually for a couple of weeks up to months. And I, this type of exchange um, between, yeah, let's say maybe two, people with completely different biographical backgrounds, but um, exchanging observations and acknowledging um, maybe difference and similarities and having that conversation space was of, um, I don't know, utmost richness, total, yeah, privilege and something that I deeply feel is um, needed. And, um, oh God, I mean, yeah stopping it here but um it's a it's a fantastic and really difficult question it is thank you yeah muhammad um i have a lot of sort of random thoughts but i'll start somewhere and see where i get uh, <laughs> that's wish me luck um you know when i started uh maybe 10 years ago presenting about sayyid karim as soon as i would start with the basic biographical notes and mention his education and eth uh zurich comes up uh, this was actually more in the US, I must say, this response. Uh, one of the first questions, almost consistently with almost every presentation or talk or lecture, would be uh, a kind of uh, weaponizing his Western education against him to dismiss his contribution to architecture by saying, well, well, he studied in Zurich. Well, what do you expect? Of course, he used concrete and did like white surfaces, as if uh, from that provincial understanding of how architecture develops, it only existed in this sort of an imaginary province called, I don't know, White Landia or something. I'm not sure, because <laughs> it's not really a geographic place. It's just kind of a random conception. Um, so then I went to ETH Zurich and I discovered through the archive that the story that I mentioned, this anecdote about the fact that he went to school uh, for a year, basically to just prove that as an Egyptian, he's capable to learn in this institution. That sounds like a struggle to me. It doesn't sound uh, like simply going to ETH Europe. Uh, he sort of became something else and then went back to Egypt to spread the light of, of European modernity. Obviously, it never works that way. And of course, doing that work as a student myself in the West, and I need to mention why, how that happened in the first place, I myself was facing struggles uh, of various types. Um, so I wouldn't want 
to accept a narrative like that about a historical figure, let's say Karim, because it also implies that just simply by me being a, a student in a Western institution that I'm a mere recipient, like a blank, a blank statement or something like a blank space that uh, was filled with knowledge again, where in fact my lived experience says otherwise. In fact, I can see that it was students like myself who were asking the hard questions where everybody else was nodding their heads. Yeah, Le Corbusier, wow. And you know, like we were the ones asking the hard questions. And so anyway, so I would say, going to the note of what is to think of sort of the diversity of Western education, well, we need to also kind of revisit what do we ever mean by the West, uh, because obviously, it's an old debate, but it seems to, that there are certain term, terms that seem to have uh, sort of uh, like a hard glue, like they don't go away. We just accept that there's something called the West. Um, fine, I'm happy some people would like to believe that that thing exists, but let's talk more about what that is. Just like we randomly and consistently use the term post-colonial, where all the people who actually lived that moment of post-colonialism prefer to use the term neo-colonialism, which if we look around today, well, that is what's happening. In fact, we skipped a phase. I mean, I would say phase two was the Cold War, which was a really nice uh, rebranding of actually a remanaging of the colonial project with financial institutions and military uh, interventions and so on. Well, I'm not quite sure why we say post at this point anymore. And phase three is actually what's been um, uh, branded as globalization, which is colonialism 3.0 with the participation of local elites. Uh, okay, so why do we still use the word West and uh, as if it's a pure thing where everybody else is a part, is kind of a, a short term visitor? And why do we still use the term post colonial as if colonialism actually ended? Um, you know, uh, I think this. Uh, should help maybe answer Philip's question as to what is the role of Western institutions. Uh, you know, I'd like to see more funding. I'd like to see more space. I'd like to see more diversity, uh, not in a sort of a tokenizing way, which is consistently what happens. It's always about, you know, today we feel guilty about, um, um, I, I don't know, um, white, uh, white black relations in the US, let's hire a black woman. Uh, and that becomes the end of the story. Or tomorrow we feel guilty about the Palestinian uh, thing, so let's do this. Well, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a consistent and permanent long-term solution to the issues that we're actually handling. So I, I think there is a lot of role for Western institutions, recognition of its own constructiveness and it, the involvement of many voices, like the many voices in this room. Um, also, uh, a criti uh, institutional critique about the ways in which uh, a lot of white professionals actually sort of uh, become uh, sidelined when they take on a critical position towards the history of colonialism in certain ways. And certain voices that have seen this happen all the time, where even if you're white, <laughs> you can be uh, outcast once you, and this happens all the time. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, and funding and so on. So there is plenty for Western institutions to do uh, besides what's already been happening. Thanks. Yeah. I think Wael has a mic, yeah. Yes, uh, going back to Philip's interesting question about uh, self and other and Amin's notion of uh, counter uh, narratives and ca uh, counter um, uh, archi archives. I tell you a funny anecdote uh, about our research. When I was trying trying to convince my partner Rafi Haqi to help me with the research, he's based in uh, Washington DC. Um, uh, he said uh, furiously, "But just tell me about one good Syrian archivist. Who's the good Syrian archivist?" I told him George Herbid. He said, but he's Lebanese. So I, remind, I reminded him in, in something very interesting, which happened at the late 80s when we were both students in the US. We had Philip Johnson come to the, to the, uh, to the, to the faculty in, in Pratt Institute and give a small informal talk. And after that, in the Q&A, somebody asked him, but who is the most famous German architect now? He said, James Sterling. And the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the hall just exploded. In it's, it's very witty. So you have to know the subtleties of the late postmodern era uh, era and how postmodernism came into Germany. But there is a notion that people, although they visit and live, there is this notion of them being transformed. 
um, the, the, the highlight for me in, uh, of this is the person, the persona, persona of T.E. Lawrence when he came to Arabia and you know, he had his agenda. But later on in his life, he was transformed by living with, with the people of the, of the uh, Jazeera Al Arabiya. And uh, he repented and apparently he committed suicide because he could not, um, he had this sort of schizophrenic uh, conscious that he betrayed the people who had actually opened up to him and gave him and believed in him. And he took them to a very, very dangerous space whereby the whole area was dismantled. If I may. Uh... Yes, OK. Thank you. Uh, a very interesting discussion triggered by uh, Amin first and then uh, all of you and, and Philip. Um, but I have to remind uh, us that the trigger of all of this uh, was a German person, uh, Mona Kriegler, directing or heading the, the, the Goethe Institute in, in Ramallah. Huh? Uh, and therefore, her presence there, not her nationality necessary, but uh, empathy and uh, uh, heart and mind uh, and uh, vision made her think that this was necessary. And I don't think it's an issue of nationality. It's an issue of being somehow from the place. And this is why when Mercedes, I mean, for me, you are Egyptian, Mercedes, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, because what, what is being Egyptian? Huh? Uh, more than understanding Egypt. Well, what's the use of an Egyptian who doesn't understand Egypt or, or whatever, any other nationality? So, uh, but, but then the issue is, yes, I mean, is right in a certain way that there is a period that we have to, uh, go through in which uh, actions and reactions and uh, uh, tensions and emotions having to do with all these things have to be diluted in a certain way, but they cannot be diluted without some serious work and research that puts things again on the table. So we don't think, take things as granted as we are told about our own histories and so on. But at the same time, the other risk, and maybe I'm saying something obvious, is to uh, be so obsessed with this issue of us and them that we play their game in the end. And, and I think that, uh, I mean, I, I, we, we discuss all the time with, uh, with Khaldun about these issues of borders. You know, there are some phys physical borders between countries and there are borders in our minds that force us to uh, corner ourselves in a certain place and sometimes fight, uh, fight a battle that is not the, the, the important one. What I think is extremely interesting in all of this exercise is precisely that when we started discussing this issue, we asked questions that were not necessarily related to uh, the problem we're talking about now. And of course it pops up again, and that's normal. The questions we were asking had to do with the architectural production and society and so on, of course. And we asked very, very specific questions and sent them to the authors. We will discuss this a bit tomorrow again, again, another teaser. But it is to say that yes, these are important questions and uh, I'm very happy that each of these uh, sessions is going in a different direction, but uh, the story will be complete, the puzzle will be complete uh, tomorrow after we do all the other sessions. So thank you very much for all these contributions. Thank you. And maybe this is a perfect note to finish on and just remind more of teasers for tomorrow. There are two panels throughout the day um, on activism for preservation and on modes of preservation, renewal and adaptive reuse. And in the evening, there is the book presentation. So just a like, reminder. Uh, and yeah, maybe I ended here and I thank you all for your amazing contributions and the audience for a lovely discussion. Thank you. Okay.